It's a call that's telling me I'm here to serve It's a need to make a difference in the world 24 hours day or night These healing hands will make it right Looking in their eyes I know that I'm changing lives Changing lives Changing lives For the better For the better Changing lives Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Annie Varghese and welcome back with another edition of the Best Docs Network featuring some of the best physicians in the Houston area that help change people's lives. We have a great show for you today. Let's learn more about our first doctor, Dr. Gabriel Meislos. So Ms. Gudelia Arvas, uh, she came to my office and she complained of a short fourth toe. This is a congenital deformity. We call it brachymetatarsia. And essentially, the fourth metatarsal stops growing and it's not as long as the other metatarsals. That causes a short fourth toe and a floppy toe. When I was 10 years old, um, my foot started to hurt. Every time I used slips or like shoes, it bothered me a lot. Basically, I couldn't wear a lot of shoes or tennis shoes because it would bother me. Cosmetically, it's disturbing as well as it can cause problems, you know, physically and, and pain and other discomforts. I really didn't thought there was a possibility we can do that. But when we came here, the doctor actually told me, yes, there is a possibility you can actually do it. The procedure is done in an outpatient setting. Uh, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to do. Uh, and then, you know, the patient goes home. Uh, and outside of coming in for dressing changes, suture removals, uh, most of the work is done at home and just involves uh, turning a knob four times a day. It does require uh, compliance, you know, as far as not, uh, you know, excessively weight-bearing and really uh, risking injuring the operative site. It's been eight months since the surgery and I've been able to run better. It's, I can walk faster. I could do a lot of stuff now since it's over. The procedure itself uh, is not painful, uh, but it does take time. Uh, we can't make bone grow overnight. So uh, it can take two to three months, uh, but in the end, uh, it's really, I mean, dramatic results, um, which you can see from the uh, x-rays as well as the pictures for Ms. Artemis. It's better because I can run better. I can wear my shoes more comfortably. I don't have the feeling that, oh, I can't wear my shoes because it's gonna hurt. It's really better. I can do a lot more things than before. The difference with the sleeve uh, compared to the gastric bypass is that there's no malabsorptive component to the surgery. It avoids some of the long-term issues that can happen with the gastric bypass. In particular, there are very few uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies later because everything goes down the normal way. The gold standard operation, of course, is the gastric bypass. And it's been around for 50 years. It has very predictable weight loss. What we're seeing is uh, patients who are a year out from surgery who've lost 60, 70, or 80 percent of their extra body weight. Well, I had what's called the Ruin Y, is where they make a small pouch um, out of the stomach and they divert part of the intestines so that I have a little bit of malabsorption. So I have to supplement my diet with uh, several vitamins that would otherwise not be absorbed through part of the intestines. Jean had gone and, and had a lap band operation done previously with another surgeon. And like some of the lap band patients, she, what she'd experienced was uh, a frustrating cycle of, of having the band adjusted to a certain tightness and getting some difficult symptoms from that, uh, only to have it loosened to make those symptoms go away and then uh, losing a little bit of weight and then gaining it back. And 
she has lost somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, two-thirds of her extra body weight from the level that she was at with the gastric bypass. Two-thirds of the weight has gone away. My friends comment that I have more pep in my step and I'm able to work more days in a row and longer hours and not feel fatigued. I looked at the breakdown for the last 12 months and it appears that about 74% of the patients are choosing the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Most of the rest of the patients are choosing a gastric bypass and we're doing very few lap bands currently, mostly because the weight loss just isn't as predictable with the lap bands and there are some long-term issues. Go to the seminars, especially Dr. Marvin, who is very open, explains things in a very simple way for everyone to understand. We have numerous support groups here in Houston and that has been my main success. Welcome. Today we're joined by Dr. Denton Cooley, a native Houstonian and the actual founder of the Texas Heart Institute. What a pleasure uh, to be with you today, Dr. Cooley. Thank you for joining us. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for visiting our institution. Can you tell us a, a little background about how the Texas Heart Institute became an entity? Well, it, uh, I think, began in the mid-1950s when open heart surgery was first introduced uh, in our Texas Medical Center. And uh, before long, my program here at St. Luke's and Children's Hospital was probably the most prolific of all institutions in the country, including the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic and everything. And we had a simplified technique of open heart surgery and soon began a, a leadership position uh, in this new field of cardiac surgery. Well, then I decided to create this institute in 1962. So it's been a little over 50 years ago. What is your most uh, vivid memory about the Texas Heart Institute, about um, any type of um, incredible uh, learning uh, that has been occurring here? What, what's your greatest memory? Well, of course, our Heart Institute was created with two objectives, that is research and education. So in each of those aspects of our uh, uh, history, I think uh, there are certain exciting things that have happened. And when the Texas Heart Institute first came into being, cardiothoracic surgery was um, high on the list of um, uh, available uh, procedures to be done for patients. Now we have uh, the artificial heart and uh, the LVADs, and so, how, how do you, would you tell the audience about that? Well, I think that uh, it shows the evolution of, of, of cardiac surgery. First, we started off uh, replacing just some of the components of the, of the human heart. That is the um, valves and the great vessels and modifying the ventricles and that sort of thing. And then the big uh, breakthrough came uh, in 1968 uh, when we did the first successful heart transplant to replace the entire organ. And that was really an exciting period that followed that. It was such a, a new concept. Amazing, right? Yeah. And we have actual um, uh, volunteers here at the hospital who have uh, been survivors of, for, from cardiac transplant for about 20 years now. Oh, yes. Uh, our initial work and transplantation. We did, I think, about 15 or 20 heart transplants in that early era. But so many of these patients uh, suffered from rejection of the tissues. But in the early 1980s, a new breakthrough came with the development of a drug called cyclosporin, which is still in use today and has made it possible for some patients to survive transplantation for uh, 20 or 30 years, so it's a really a big change. Quite miraculous, and you are such a part of that um, yeah. endeavor, and we, we humbly thank you for everything you've done for the world population, actually. Well, it's been great <laughs> satisfaction to me to see how this uh, institution and our whole medical center has grown uh, during my lifetime. Thank you, and now we're taking you again all over the world with Best uh, Docs Network, and um, 
we just uh, wonder if you have something um, in these closing remarks, if you can tell our public um, something about the Texas Heart Institute that you would like them to take to heart. Well, I think that we have done a great deal to uh, reach our objective, original objective of research and education. But at the same time, we've made many advances in just clinical uh, medicine and surgery and uh, have enjoyed a leadership position in this new uh, development now. Uh, it's, it's sort of uh, inspired the entire um, medical community around the world. And you can find uh, large cardiac programs going in Europe and South America and, and elsewhere in North America. Just amazing to see how rapidly it's expanded. Well, for all of us who have trained under your great leadership, we humbly thank you. And uh, we give you great honor, Dr. Cooley. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Many patients complain of leg pain from vein problems. Veins can dilate, they can become aesthetically unpleasing, but they can also cause vascular abnormalities which can lead to clot formation. Dr. Peter Morgan is a vein specialist, and let's look at this segment how he has helped one patient about a vein problem. what he could do for me and um, what the benefits, what the side effects, and it gave me an opportunity to um, just weigh the pros and cons of whether I wanted to go, go forward. The treatment is to close all the veins that are running backwards. Any vein that is not pumping up out of the leg is only hurting, it doesn't help, and so by removing or closing those veins, you restore the circulation out of the legs back to normal. The procedure itself probably took 30 to 45 minutes. I was able to get up off the procedure table right afterwards and walk. I did have improvement in uh, cosmetically, which is a wonderful side benefit, but I also have decreased swelling, decreased aching. Really, it's, it's very minimal. She got a great result. Her swelling has uh, gone away completely. Her pain has gone away completely, and her varicose veins have gone away completely as well. For more information on any of the doctors you've seen on today's show, go to our website, bestdocsnetwork.com. Now it's time for me to share a story with you. My passion is the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. I've practiced 20 years touching people's lives, saving their lives, ministering to their lives. 
Let's watch this story about one patient who came to my practice and how we helped that person. As you get older, sometimes you have trouble finding words. So my daughter got all worried, you know, so she'd maybe go to a, you know, a neurologist. So he does his thing, go back later, he said, it looks like you had a couple small strokes. They're small, they're not gonna bother you. But, he says, you need to go to a, a cardiologist to check out your heart, just to be on the safe side. Valvular heart disease encompasses many um, different entities. The heart has four different valves, and uh, Gary Singerman had actually um, infection and rupture of his mitral valve, which is a very important valve separating the top and bottom chamber of the left side of the heart. So she sent me to uh, Houston Northwest Hospital, where she had them or ordered ultrasound for me. Uh, you know, I feel fine. Can I go home now? So my wife and I are sitting there, and she comes in with this film of the ultrasound. She says, um, could you see the mitral valve there? I said, no, I'm not trained for that. So she points with it to her pen and says, right there, it's hanging down in the ventricle. It's, it's, it's been ruined with, with the bacteria, and it, it's not doing anything. And so uh, she says, uh, within a month, you're gonna have a massive heart failure. And I heard my wife gasp, you know, and I got rocked, I wait a minute, you know, I feel fine. She said, I'm checking you into the hospital right now. Mr. Singerman had mitral valve prolapse, therefore the valve was um, not closing properly, was redundant and thick, and therefore it was easy for bacteria to stick to that valve and cause infection. And this happened before I met him, and the his story is quite interesting how he came to me he immediately needed surgery because his valve was infected and ruptured and not working at all. But he's very thankful that he came because we were able to save him. Obviously, I, I lived. But the point is I may not have if Dr. Varghese had caught that ruined mitral valve. And so uh, I owe her. Cholesterol is an important thing. You need to know your cholesterol number. Now, there are three numbers when it comes to cholesterol. There's total cholesterol. That's important for diagnosing whether you have a problem or not. And then there's HDL cholesterol. That's the good cholesterol. You want that to be high. If you're a man, you want your HDL cholesterol to be above 40. And if you're a woman, you want your HDL cholesterol to be above 50. Now the LDL is the bad cholesterol. That's the most important number to know because that's the one that predicts your risk of heart attacks and strokes. For example, your LDL for most people should be less than 160. Now if you have certain diseases like hypertension or diabetes, or if you're getting older, then you really want it to be 130. That's the LDL, 130. If you have certain diseases like uh, diabetes plus hypertension, then you kind of want to look at a number that's under 100. Now, if you have heart disease or have had a stroke or have significant risk factors in your family, for example, for early heart disease, then you really want your uh, LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, to be less than 70. So know your number. Your doctor can get it for you pretty easily. As I was aging, I guess, my teeth weren't as pretty as they used to be, so I found that I wasn't smiling as much as I used to. You know, Cindy's a very beautiful lady. Um, a lot of the patients I see, probably the majority of patients I see, are women, you know, over the age of 40, who a lot of times, you know, they, they take care of themselves, they stay in shape, they look great. But there's just some things they want to do to try to look younger. And for Sandy, you know, getting her teeth whiter, straightened up a little bit with the veneers was perfect for her. I've seen a lot of Dr. Lewis's work and have been so impressed. So I came to see him and I'm so glad I did because now I smile all the time. It just really works great for a lot of people and she was a perfect candidate for that. It's amazing to me that doing the, doing the veneers like we did for her, which is a pretty simple two visit process, two or three weeks apart, what a difference it can make in how someone looks. I mean, and literally 10 or 15 years younger. It's painless, it doesn't take long. Dr. Lewis is very um, 
sensitive to, to your feelings, to how you want to look. He's a good listener. He listens to how I wanted my smile and my teeth to look, and he did exactly what I wanted. It can be done so to where it's not like people look at you and go, wow, where'd you have your teeth done? But they look at you and go, man, you look great. You know, what have you done? Have you been working out more? Or you just look, it's, so it's a, for some people, if their teeth are really bad, yeah, it's gonna be a noticeable change. But for other people, it's just one of those things to where you just look good, you look more alive, you look more refreshed, you just look better, but it's not just a glaring, oh, what, what'd you do to your teeth, you know? My family would say, okay, what did you do? Something's different, your smile is beautiful. Did you get your hair cut? I just feel so good about my smile now. Smiling's good. I'm not a big fan of going to the dentist, so this was a big deal for me, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. For additional health information, be sure to check out our Healthy Living blog for the best tips, latest medical procedures, and up-to-date news for modern medicine at our website at bestdocsnetwork.com. Atrial fibrillation, a commonly known arrhythmia that involves the upper chambers of the heart becoming irregular and beating sometimes wildly out of control, sometimes beating very slow and causing the need for a permanent pacemaker. Atrial fibrillation is another risk for stroke and therefore patients who have atrial fibrillation really need to see their doctors, be evaluated and get on anticoagulant therapy just to pr protect them from stroke. Now what causes atrial fibrillation? That's a question that many of my patients ask, Doc, why am I having this problem? And I say, well, the electricity of the heart can change over time. Uh, sometimes as we age, our cardiac cells can change their uh, electrical impulses and uh, things can kind of go haywire. So we want to make sure that we look at an EKG each time the patient comes in. It's important to check those things and uh, ask your doctor to do an EKG if you haven't had one. If you have palpitations, if you have shortness of breath, feeling faint, make sure you have your uh, rhythm, uh, rhythm evaluated with uh, an event monitor or some type of Holter monitor. It's very important, atrial fibrillation is something easily treated. Protect yourself, get your heart checked today. Our smile is such an important part of our lives. Keeping a healthy smile is also important. Dr. Paul Metz is an oral surgeon who helps patients to keep their healthy smile. Let's watch this story about a patient and how he helped them. Dorothy, she had multiple teeth that were decayed and she had failing restoration. So she had a history of having uh, multiple dental procedures on her natural teeth. And these restorations had subsequently failed over time, secondary to wear uh, as well as decay. I came to see Dr. Metz and I was, of course, just knocked out. <laughs> My heart went, <laughs> he was so nice and encouraging, he said, yes, I think we can help you. At 90 years old, she had all her lower teeth removed in placement of four dental implants and also placement of an immediate prototype, so to speak. So she had fixed teeth on the day that her teeth were removed. Right, I had no problem whatsoever. It worked, I went, I, it, I, I, could, I could eat and chew and, and I looked normal and uh, I, was, I was just perfectly happy with it. 
her situation is not unique. There's many people in her age group that just by virtue of their age, their teeth are beginning to fail. Many of them are under the misconception that they're too old to have oral surgery safely. Um, although by virtue of their age, that age bracket, we do more implants in that age bracket than any other age bracket. So they do tremendously well with it, just like somebody much younger. And also their health improves afterwards. And I just was thrilled. That first steak was like, out of heaven, it was paradise. You know, it was just wonderful. I was so thrilled and happy. You know, with their fixed teeth, they're able to chew what they want and not foods that ha are high in sugar. And so they're healthier in the long run. For one, they're not fighting infected teeth. They have a healthier state in their mouth and they're able to chew what they want and they're able to have a much more balanced diet. I would say, don't do that. Don't tough it out. Go get something to <laughs> go get some dental implants <laughs> and be comfortable like I am. When you ask these individuals after they've had this, this procedure done, they say they feel more energetic. They just feel better. And then we feel that it's their body not fighting a chronic infection, that they're in a healthier state overall. We are one million strong. We are united behind a cure. There are over one million colorectal cancer survivors in the United States. My name is Charles Kelly from Lady Antebellum, and I'm in this fight against colorectal cancer because it actually hits pretty close uh, to my family. My father-in-law uh, was diagnosed with it, and the thing about this disease is it is preventable, and so I encourage everybody to go get screened. Let's beat this thing. Prevention and therapy of osteoporosis is one of Dr. Meredith Morgan's specialties. Dr. Morgan offers some suggestions that could help prevent this disease. If a woman's normal, uh, a healthy lifestyle should be adequate. The question about diet, nutrition, and exercise, part of life would be an active lifestyle. Weight-bearing exercise, say five times a week for 30 minutes, is good for cardiovascular, and it, it's good for the bones. So walking is great. So if a person can do that, that's the ideal for the bone health. Therapy is indicated on a risk factor. If there's been a fracture, it's obvious the disease exists. If there has not been a fracture, but the absolute risk projects to over 20% for a major fracture of the spine, arm, wrist, or a 3% 10-year risk of the hip, then drug therapy is indicated. Dr. Morgan can adjust his treatment depending on his patient's lifestyle. There are basically two groups of first-line therapy. The bisphosphonates, to use a big chemical phrase, and demonzomab, which is a type of immune therapy. These have been proven to be effective and significantly reduce the risk of fracture. Highly, highly preferred to obtain our calcium in the diet. Just make it really short and easy, about 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. In terms of nutrition, this is very serious. There is controversy, but there's enough evidence to indicate that a person who tries to treat osteoporosis only with calcium supplements or calcium and vitamin D supplements may have an associated 30% higher risk of having a coronary event, a heart attack. It's mainly theory as to why this would happen, and there are some people that don't believe it would happen, but in terms of the alternative managements of the disease or the high risk, we're talking about nutrition, supplements in a reasonable dosage, and the lifestyle of exercise and fall prevention. What a fabulous show we had today. I hope this helped you to discover some things that you need to do to protect yourself and your family. The Best Docs Network features some of the best physicians in the Houston area that have helped change people's lives. For more information for any of the fine doctors that you've seen today on today's show, head to our website at bestdocsnetwork.com. If you have a question or a comment for us, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. See you next time.